today we are looking at Jesus is opening up his kingdom. So in Matthew chapter 1, back to the newsletters outline, let's jump into our message today. A husband was trying to prove to his wife that women talk more than men. He showed her a study which indicated that men use about 10,000 words per day, where women use about 20,000 words per day. His wife thought about this for a while. She then told her husband that women use twice as many words as men because they have to repeat everything they said. Her husband just sort of looked stunned and he said, What? <laughs> I don't care if you don't laugh, that's a good joke. Um, it is so easy to block out what we don't want to hear. It is so easy to block out what we've heard repeatedly. When my family and I first moved into Grand Ridge, no one told us that Grand Ridge has an alarm system, the siren that goes off down there, that, that, where we live just right there, corner, kitty corner to the fire station. And so they have a volunteer fire station that comes off. And it also goes off at, uh, every Saturday at 10 o'clock and a few other times. It just goes off at random. And so we're there the very first time, a couple days in the house, and all of a sudden this incredibly loud siren just goes, Rrr! and my family does what your family would do. We break out. I'm like, what is going on? Why is this siren happening? And I'm like, is this the trumpet of God? I'm like, kids, come on. Get out on the yard. Jesus is coming. And it just scared us the very first time. You know what's happened as time's gone by? We don't even pay attention to that siren now. We have heard it so often. We have heard it so many times. We have become immune to it. In fact, we'll carry on conversations while it goes on. It used to be when it would go up, Isabel, you know, little Isabel, not Nate, little Isabel, instead she thought it was a tornado warning, but she couldn't get the word tornado out, so she called it a potato. <laughs> so she would yell through the house, potato warning, potato warning, and go running through it. Now she sleeps completely through it, and it doesn't even bother her. See, what happens is we hear something repeatedly and over and over, and we become immune to it. Can I say this to you? That it happens with Jesus. You were raised in church. You've heard the gospel and you've heard the messages. You know the stories and you even know my jokes before I finish them. And you have become immune to hearing what God's going to talk to you about. It happens by accepting Christ. You've heard it repeatedly that you need to receive Christ as your Savior. You need to let Him be the payment of your sin. And what's happened is you have become immune to the gospel. If you're taking notes, today, Jesus is always inviting us closer. He is always inviting us closer. Closer to that you would come to know Him first as your Lord and Savior and accept His payment on the cross for your sin. Yes, He's inviting you closer. If you've never made that commitment for Christ and accepted Jesus into your heart, Tim, this week, Tim, Tim this week accepted Jesus and is a Savior, so that's awesome. Right. So, if you've never heard anything about that, If you've never made that commitment, Jesus is constantly inviting you. But Christian, that's where we get immune. He's constantly inviting you to take your relationship closer to him. We think it means more service, more of this, giving more, taking the pastor to lunch. Those are all good things, especially the lunch. And we think it means that that's not what he's inviting you to do. He's inviting you to come closer to him. Learn more. Let him have parts of your heart that you've held back. It's so easy to go through motions. A husband and wife were at a party chatting with some friends when the subject of marriage counsel came up. Oh, well, we'll never need that. My husband and I have a great relationship, the wife explained. He's a communications major in college, and in college I was a, a theaters major. He communicates really well, and I just act like I'm listening. It is easy to know when to say amen, when to shake hands, when to act like you're listening, when to tear up, when to be moved by the Spirit. It's so easy, but that is not what Jesus wants. He wants a closer relationship. And today, He's inviting you to come. In Matthew chapter 21, we've called it the triumphal en the entry. It is the week before the crucifixion. And people will have a choice about who Jesus is. He is going to force the issue. Let's, let me just stop here for a moment. He does not force himself upon anybody, but he does force the issue. 
He will force the issues with the Pharisees. It's your choice to make. He will force the issues with the people in the crowd. It's your choice to make. Some will choose and say Hosanna and will follow him. Some will betray him and just the next week will cry crucify him. And today, Jesus is not forcing the decision that you're going to make, but he is forcing the choice. He is forcing the issue upon you to make a decision. And by the way, everyone makes a decision about Christ every Sunday. Everyone that you say, well, Pastor, I didn't come forward. No, everyone makes a decision about Christ. Your decision may be to reject him one more week. Your decision may be to not allow him to come closer for one more week. But everyone makes a decision about Jesus today. So, Matthew chapter 21. He's giving them an opportunity, one more chance, one more opportunity to the Pharisees to sort of take him at his word and to say he is who he says he is. And here we have their response. Instead of just telling you about this parable, I'm going to break it down and go through it with you verse by verse. So jump here. Here's the story he's going to give. Remember, let me remind you, a parable is a story. A story Jesus gives to teach a spiritual truth. So here we go. Verse 33. There was a certain householder. Okay. Everybody in the parable represents somebody. Obviously, the householder represents God. This, this is a very simple one to pick apart. You don't have to have a master's degree or a doctorate degree to understand this. Do you realize the Bible is very easy? Anybody that tells you the Bible can say anything it wants, no, only if you want to do that. If you believe the Bible, it's pretty clear on most issues. That's what you say, amen? <laughs> hey, thank you. You're listening. Just don't say shut up. Verse 33. Which planted a vineyard and hedged around it, about it, and digged a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let. He's leasing it. He's going to basically, I would have never understood this before I came to this part of the country, but he's basically leasing his land to some farmers to use it. Verse 33. It out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. A uh, little side note, if you like to put notes in your Bibles, this passage has a lot of little notes to put. Isaiah 5.2. It's a reference that they would have completely understood that the vineyard was representing Israel. God was using the nation of Israel is what he's saying here, verse 34. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits. All right, maybe a little more complicated, but the fruits that he gave the nation of Israel is a reference to the prophets. The prophets that, that God sent from Isaiah and Jeremiah, all of them, Elijah, God sent to them to talk to them and to tell them what God was saying. Much like what I'm doing now, it telling you what God has said. Verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Verse 36. And again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did the same unto them. What really is happening here in the story, they don't want to pay the rent. They don't want to pay the rent. They farm the land. They've reaped it. They've sown it. Now, instead of paying for leasing the land, they don't want to pay it. That's what's happening in the story. But the analogy of the parable is this, that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel has rejected the prophets that God has sent. What they've really rejected, listen, you don't reject me. By the way, you don't need me. You need God. Amen? So you're not rejecting me. If you don't like my jokes, fine. If you don't like my stories, fine. If you don't like my opinion, fine. But when it's thus saith the Lord, what you are rejecting is not Pastor Steve. You are rejecting the authority of God in your life. That's right. And that's what they were doing. It wasn't the prophets they were rejecting. What they were rejecting was what God was saying. I just, a little, I didn't have a problem Wednesday. Nobody had a problem with me when I told my jokes. Oh, that was funny. Everybody laughed. You know when the problem started? When I started quoting the Bible. Now, at the end, I wanted to start quoting some temperance verses, but I'm talking about AA, but I didn't. I had a little more class. Verse 37. But at last, all of, all of, all of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. Okay. Even the slowest Pharisee knew what he was saying. Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. It was very obvious that Jesus is now talking about himself. God sent the prophets to the nation of Israel, and they rejected him. Now God is sending his Son. Verse 38. But when the husband then saw the Son, of course they received him because everybody loves Jesus. No. As we've looked 
It is very easy to take Jesus and twist him and to conform him into the Jesus of religion. It is very easy to conform him into the Jesus that your family taught you that Jesus was. Or the Jesus that some pastor or priest or, or, or teacher told you who Jesus was. But what's difficult is the Jesus of the Bible because the Jesus of the Bible is a very black and white Jesus. He's very black and white about doing right, doing wrong. He's very black and white about taking care of people, loving other people. But he's also very black and white about justice, about what's right, and about, about sin being sin. The Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus most people want to receive. That's right. Back here. What do they do? Uh, this is their heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize upon his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. And that's exactly what will happen to Jesus. They will take him out of the city and they will kill him. Just side note, Jesus didn't accidentally end up crucified. So people will tell you, oh, he was a teacher and he had these followers and everything just kind of got... And then this week, it just sort of swept him away. Here Jesus is in the middle of this week... One of many references he makes in this week of being crucified, he is basically predicting his own death. They will take me out of the city, I am the son, and they will kill me. Here's Jesus' question to them. When the Lord cometh of the vineyard, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Um, can I just tell you this, not to get into a whole eschological discussion with you, but Jesus is coming back. And the Jesus that's coming back is not the Jesus so many people have made him out to be. He's coming back and he's going to come back and judge this world. And I just say this to you, you will either meet Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you will meet him as the judge of this world. Someone once had a coffee cup and it said, uh, uh, Jesus is coming, quick, look busy. <laughs> Verse 40, uh, 41. Here's their answer. They pronounce their own judgment. Uh, they say unto him, He will mi uh, miserably destroy those wicked men. Yeah, that's, that's what God does when he's faced with sin. That's why you can't enter into his presence with sin. That's why you must be born again. That's why you must have Jesus' payment. Destroy those wicked men. And will let out his vineyard into the husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits of their seasons. And I think Jesus... He has to be frustrated at this moment because he just gave them a perfect story and you've seen how easy and obvious it was of what he was saying and yet they still don't get it. Verse 42, And Jesus saith unto them, maybe he's shaking his head. I like to think he's shaking his head like my father would do sometimes when he came home and said, that son of mine. Oh. <laughs> but did you never read the scriptures? That's all he did. All they did was read the scriptures. They never did anything, but they read. The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head cornerstone. This is a direct reference to Psalms 118, verse 22 and 23. Sometimes you will hear people try to accuse the Jews of killing Jesus. And then some will say, well, no, it's the Italians, the Romans. Uh, they killed Jesus. Listen, nobody killed Jesus. He laid down his life for you and for me. It wasn't an accident. It was a plan. From Genesis 3.15 all the way up through Revelation, it was a plan that God would send His Son to die for your sin. Amen? Amen. And look at this. This is the Lord's doing. And look at this last phrase. And it is marvelous in our eyes. The cross is beautiful. It's amazing how God has extended his invitation to even the hardest Pharisee, to even the worst sinner, all the way up from the sweetest, most innocent little girl. The invitation is open. Have you become immune to that amazing grace? Immune to that cross? You've had just enough Jesus to inoculate you to the message. And he wraps up the story here. Verse 43. Therefore say unto you, the kingdom of God, he changes it from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of God, shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the first fruits. That nation is the church. If you'd like a reference, 1 Peter 2.9.
That nation is the church. And the Old Testament, God will use the nation of Israel. Now, right here at the cross, we're going to see a shift. He's going to move away from the nation of Israel, and he's going to use the church in the New Testament. It is almost... <coughs> wow, excuse me. It is almost as if Jesus is quoting the Bible. In, first John, in John chapter 1, verse 10 and 12, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. And He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. He went to the nation of Israel and gave Him that opportunity. I don't know what would exactly would have happened if the nation of Israel had finally had said as mass, we receive you as our Messiah and taken him. I don't know the entire thing, but I know this, that God knew they wouldn't, and I knew they didn't, and God had a plan. And no longer is he working with the nation of Israel. He is now working with the church, with the group of believers who have accepted them as his personal Savior. If you're part of that, say amen. amen. He finishes up with this reminder, verse 44. Here's the real Jesus, the device of Jesus. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind them in, him into power. Um, if you're taking notes, Jesus is con controversial. Little side note, Luke chapter 2. Remember baby Jesus, the, the Jesus everybody likes? He's in the manger. Who doesn't like a baby? There's baby Jesus, but Simon will say about this baby Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 34, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rise again of many in Israel. You see, he's either God or he's a liar. He's either Lord or he's a liar. The old phrase is he's either Lord, lunatic, or a liar. He's somebody who claimed to be God and claimed to be the Son of God. And he said, I am the way, the only way to God, only through me, you must be born again. And if he said that, he's either a liar, knowing it wasn't true, or he was a crazy man, a lunatic, or what he said was true. And if what he said was true, then he is Lord. And if what he said was true, you better make a decision about it. That's right. Liar, lunatic, or Lord. Jesus... The real Jesus is controversial. Jesus would never say there's multiple paths to God. Oh, you have your way and you've got your way. And there's a, Listen, you can be Catholic, Baptist, uh, Presbyterian, Lutheran, all sorts of labels we put on it, whatever that is. But you know, if you're going to go somewhere, go first class, so be a Baptist. But um, you can put whatever labels you want on it. And you can be non-denominational. You can be Bible church, which is basically non-union Baptist and stuff. You can be whatever you want on that label. But if the direction is not Jesus Christ, you are not going to heaven. Jesus was very controversial on that and did not say there's your way, that way. And if you're sincere in your heart, listen, there will be a lot of sincere people in hell. He's either liar, lunatic, or he is Lord. And he invites them, and here's their response in verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard these parables, they perceived he spake of them. I just want to go up there and go, hello, McFly, finally. Verse 46. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Here's what I want to wrap up with. Three questions. How could they not accept him? Number one, they worship themselves. How could they not accept Jesus? I mean, there's, there's that we in here have never seen him, and yet we've accepted him. We've believed him. They saw a dead body, and then they saw just minutes later that dead body walking through town because Jesus had been there. They saw crippled, blind people, the lame people. They saw arms restored. They saw it all, and yet. They chose to reject him. Why? Number one, they worshipped themselves. It is common in prosperous societies, and it is common in poor countries, because it is a human issue. And that is, you can't see anything if your eyes are always on yourself. You can't see anything if your eyes are always on yourself. You know what? I'm no different. I'm my favorite person. I wake up every morning concerned about me. I'm always on my mind. I think about what I'm going to eat. I think about what I'm going to wear. I think about my day. 
I think about how things affect me. I think about how my family is going to do. I think about me, me, me. Because I am, just like you, my favorite person. It's hard to see anything else when your eyes are only on yourself. Number two, they crave normal. Okay, I'm going to risk somebody misunderstanding me, but I'm going to risk it anyways. If you want easy, if you want normal, if you want no challenges, you might want to skip Jesus. He has never come to make your life easy. He never promised easy life. He came for the specific purpose of redeeming your soul, of dying on the cross for your sin. And after that, what he expects from you is the American dream? No. Is perfection an easy life? Uh huh. After that, what he expects from you is complete and total surrender of your life. If you want easy, if you want normal, you may want to skip Jesus. Because life without Jesus is easy. That may surprise you that a pastor would say this. But life without Jesus is easy. But let me remind you, nothing, doing nothing is easy. Being selfish is easy. Sin is easy. Young people, the easiest choice you will ever make is in a group of other your peers and friends at a party is to take a drink of beer. That's the easy choice. The easy choice will always be to start drugs. It's the easy choice because you're around a group of people that will encourage you to do that. The easy choice is usually the wrong choice in your life. Amen? The easy choice is when you and your boyfriend or girlfriend are alone. And you say, well, you know, Pastor Steve, we were just kind of... No, that's the easy choice. The easy choice is, well, we're just going to uh, uh, live together before we get married. You don't buy a car without testing it out. Girls, you're a car. That's how he sees you. That's the easy choice. The easy choice when your marriage gets tough is to go, well, it's just difficult. Let's just leave. No, it's hard work to stay together. It is hard. Listen, I, it's, it's probably God's biggest joke that he would put a man and a woman together because... Women are insane. I mean, are amazing. Love you. Life without Jesus is easy because it's all about me. But life with Jesus is a challenge. I didn't say impossible. It's hard. And if you're doing the right thing, it always is hard. Whenever me and my wife, it's usually mainly my wife, my kids are a little bit better about this, but whenever we go through a drive through to order and pull up, um, I'm a man. I, I order the same thing every time. I know every, you know, if I'm going to Taco Bell, McDonald's, I'm going boom, I'm going dollar menu, boom, 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 boom. That's what I want. I want a glass of water so it makes me feel better that I'm not too fat. Okay. Very easy. I get up there, boom, boom, boom. But my wife, when it's her time, she's been to McDonald's so many times, she knows the menu. I mean, who doesn't know what they serve at Taco Bell by now? But when it's her time, she does this whole thing. Gentlemen, she leans in, and it's like she's calling the last play of the Super Bowl. Let me see. Okay. Um, <laughs> what is a taco? <laughs> and a burrito. Is it, it's, you're Hispanic. You should know this. I get it, and it's boom, boom, boom. That's what I need. That's it. That's life without Jesus. Real simple choice. You know, life without Jesus, Sunday, 9 o'clock, sleep in. But man, when you get involved with Jesus, the real Jesus, your life will get complicated. That's right. Because see, now you have to start making choices. You have to start making decisions. You have to start doing things like turning the other cheek. Loving other people. Being kind to people who are really not nice to you. Life without Jesus is easy. And the Pharisees craved normal. And lastly, number three, they just simply refuse. They simply <laughs> refuse. What will you do 
with this Jesus. The real Jesus. Not the Jesus you've made. Not the Jesus of religion. Not the Jesus of the Christmas specials. Not the Jesus you think he is. But the real Jesus who chose to reveal himself in Scripture. What will you do with the real Jesus?